Okay, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Who needs intros? I don't need intros. Let's just do it. Now, what I'm about to talk about, is it that relevant? No, not really. But hey, it's my channel. I discuss what I feel like talking about, and I just want to get my thoughts out there anyway, just because. Yes, so the Die Hard franchise. Let, let, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. I would say that the Die Hard franchise is a near-perfect action franchise, if you ask me. You have that initial film released in 1988, starring Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, amongst others. You have hero and villain, average Joe cop, what caught way in over his head in a skyscraper full of terrorists that he has to take out, and you know, rest is history. We have a follow-up to that Die Hard 2, Die Harder, or just Die Hard 2, whatever title you really want to go with on that one, released in 1990. It's very much a rinse and repeat of the first movie. Not as good, but hey, it gets the job done. It's still a solid action movie, but like I said, it's just it's just solid. It's fine. Whatever. Die Hard with a Vengeance, I'll be honest with you. On some days, I could argue Die Hard with a Vengeance is just as good, if not better, than the original. Because for me, I mean, I just, I just think it's... It just hits all the right strides for me. You have Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson, of all people, teaming up together and just just going crazy with the whole Simon Says. And you have Jeremy Irons as the villain coming back as the brother of Hans Gruber from the original, blah, blah, blah. And it's just it's just an absolute blast of a film. It, it, it runs at such a great pace. That's the thing. That film has such a great pace with all the stuff that's going on in that film. And it, it just, it does so much right. And like I said, I could argue that it's even better than the original at times. It's just a back and forth thing for me. That's just me. Live free or die hard. Okay, you have the fourth injury here. This is the this was the more obviously modern film. It's 12 years after the third film. And it's John McClane in more modern day. He's more older, more grizzled. Just, again in over his head in this situation due to cyber terrorists and so you have the younger hacker guy who's the second half of the equation as far as a team up goes you have old school john mcclain just just rugged just fists just throwing and shooting and shit like he's the cowboy and you have the young boy who's gonna sit there and help him to outsmart the villains of this film now if you ask me live free or die hard is is a damn good action movie. I don't give a shit what anyone says. People sit there and say that, oh, it was PG-13. Yeah, it was PG-13. It was stupid. But if you ask me when I watch it, even if it's not the unrated cut, it doesn't ruin it for me. Because again, it just has great pacing. And the action is just so, it's ramped up each and every time. All the all the action set pieces are solid as hell. And to, so as far as I'm concerned, I don't even really notice it when I watch it. It's just going along. I'm just along for the ride. It doesn't hinder me one bit. Now, as far as the villain side of things, Timothy Oliphant, not the best. He's not He's not a Hans Gruber. He's not even a Simon Gruber. He's not that. But if you ask me, Timothy Oliphant, very underrated actor, and he serves his purpose in this film. Because this is where the point in the Die Hard franchise were post Live Free or Die Hard obviously everything falls apart because there are a few essential things that you need in a Die Hard film. You need basically, obviously, John McClane. You need John McClane to be in a situation where he's in over his head. But if you know this one thing about the Die Hard franchise is that it's never just John McClane. Yeah, he's the sole hero of the film for the most part. He's the guy that's going to get the job done by the end of it. He's the guy that you're rooting for. He's the guy that you're going through this experience with. But with each film up until this point, he's always had that one secondary character that helps push him to the finish line. If you notice that. He had Al Powell in the, in the first movie talking to him over the radio, letting him know the ins and outs, what's going on on the outside. And especially towards the end of the film where you start to realize that he's also more of a consoling figure for him throughout. He's like the, he's like the cheerleader for him. He's he's the guy who's almost like helping him keep a stable head throughout, help kind of push him through. And that's like I said right at the end of the film 
when he's all battered. He's got the glass in his feet. He's stuck. He has out in that conversation with him saying, oh, yeah, say this to Holly if I don't make it. He needed Al. If he didn't have Al, honestly, right towards the tail end, his character probably would have wound up dead. And that's what you notice. The second film, not as prominent of the character. Honestly, I can't even remember his name. But he's still like a sidekick character. He's a guy who's also going to kind of help him kind of, you know, navigate the airport to kind of help figure things out. Be like, oh, this is what we kind of need to do here. But like I said, this character doesn't play as big of a part as all the other sort of sidekicks in the franchise. But he does play a part in that. Die Hard with a Vengeance, obviously you have a, a name like Sam Jackson, you have the personality of a Sam Jackson to really hold his own against John McClane. And yet again, if not for this guy, John McClane probably would have failed this scenario yet again. Because, again, he, he drags him along. He lies to say where the initial explosion went off at the start of the film, said it was in Harlem when it was really like Chinatown. Just to drag him along to, to to help him out with the games, with the Simon Says, because he needed his brain, he needed his assistance, and also because, well, Simon Says, like, okay, well, kind of get, get this guy in there. And so, once again, like I said, he needed Zeus in that scenario. So, there's always that sidekick element to the Die Hard films to where... If John McClane didn't have that secondary character, he probably would have been screwed. He probably would have made about two-thirds of the way through before he didn't finish. Because if you think about it, it changes the whole equation and the whole, like, is John McClane going to make it out of here? And so, obviously, with sequels, like, ramping up, you got to ramp, ramp up the action. It's only natural for an action sequel, especially for such a later film in 2007 with Live Free or Die Hard. Now, if you ask me, the action went just over the top enough. Everyone wants to complain about the jet shit at the end. Honestly, you can say that, but for what it is, it doesn't bother me. It, it went just over the top enough where it's not like he's literally riding on the back of a jet, flying through the city at full speed. Okay, it's it's low enough to the ground. He, he kind of like falls on the back of it. He hangs off. He kind of jumps off. I don't see it as like that big of a fucking deal, okay? For, for a diehard film at this point in time, that really meant jack shit as far as I'm concerned. Because like I said, it's a good solid movie. And I really have next to no negatives to give it. Because this is where Bruce Willis is actually still giving life to the character. He's actually still giving life in his performances. Where he still felt like John McClane. Because once again, yeah, despite its slight more over the top nature. You still needed that secondary character. Which was Justin Long's uh, Matthew Farrell. To help him... To, to be the brains of the operation to help understand these hackers, these terrorists that they need to take out, because he's because he's a dinosaur in this. John McClane is. He's not. He's not the smart one. He's just he he's the brute force uh, to Matt Farrell's. He he's to Matt Farrell's brains of the operation. He needed that yet again, despite like I said, despite the over the top nature. He needed that character to help push him through because he would have been completely lost. And as he says in the film. Trust me, kid, if there's someone else to do it, I would let them do it, but there's not. So we're doing it. And that pre that perfectly sets it up. And as far as the whole PG-13 R rated, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It moves at a solid enough pace where I hardly even notice it. Yeah, the unrated cut helps it a bit, adds a little bit more. Especially when one scene where he's talking to Matt in the car, he's just kind of rambling on. He's like, hey, shut up up shut the fuck up that's in the unrated cut and it adds so much more of a punch that you usually get from john mcclain and so where yeah that should have just stayed in but whatever so to me that's where the Die Hard franchise basically ends each film up until this point is perfectly solid and to really go deeper into it just a little bit you realize that john mcclain always needed those secondary characters to help push him through and not to mention just the overall supporting cast has always been very, very good. Good Day to Die Hard, this is a whole other story. From the get-go, when this was released in 2013, February, I think it was like Valentine's Day when this came out, or Valentine's Weekend. I didn't like this film pretty much from the start. <laughs> it's, it's just that bad. John McClane is nowhere to be found. He's just nothing but a pure asshole throughout the whole film. 
the the first like real big action sequence the chase sequence on the freeway is like shaky cam it's insane no real good supporting characters in this like no real recognizable names in all the previous films you had you had names that you could kind of like recognize throughout and you recognize next to no one in this film at all like Cole Hauser is in there for like two minutes and then he's dead like you have Jai Courtney which I know a lot of people either well mostly just hate him but I mean I don't have any ill will towards the guy whatsoever I'm a Spartacus fan he was on that show I liked him fine obviously Captain Boomerang he did a fine job but you know I feel like he has something in him depending on whatever project he's given so he had nothing to work with here anyway and yeah, this is where the franchise just falls apart. And it's, and there's, like I say, you don't have John McClane at all. You don't have a decent enough sidekick. You don't have a good supporting cast. You have none of that shit. A Good Day to Die Hard is the only film in the franchise I do not consider whatsoever. I almost do wish they would do a sixth movie just to at least try to end it on a high note as opposed to whatever the fuck this was. Retcon A Good Day to Die Hard and just give us... Just fucking just die hard. Fuck your mother. I don't care. <laughs> I just, I, I don't, I, I don't care. So up until that point, it was damn near perfect. But a good day to die hard just fucked everything up. If you ask me, that'll do it for this video. I am Iron Raven and I am out.